Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Sade Badrinwa. Hello, everyone. How are you? If everybody could please take their seats. We're about to get started. Our next discussion is going to be on how do we protect integrity in sports. And this is sure to be a hot topic when we're talking about anti-doping and so many other issues that are happening in the sport. So please take your seat. And uh, I've got a rock star team here. Let me introduce them to you. You know, we heard from athletes earlier today talking about, you know, you have to believe what you see, that perception is everything. You have one bad person in the group and it really destroys the sport. So let's get started. We have Muriel Balestrazi. She is the president of Interpol. And I am proud to say she was just elected in November by the Interpol General Assembly in Rome. She will serve as president until 2016 and is the first woman. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> and we have Andy Cunningham, who is the global head of integrity at Betfair one of the world's largest international online sports betting providers. He has worked with the Integrity team uh, for eight years now, and he's responsible for monitoring and investigating any unusual or suspect betting patterns at Betfair. We also have Olivier Rabin. He is the science director for the past decade at the World Anti-Doping Agency. He has established international reputation as an expert in pharmaceutical research and development, so please welcome him as well. We we also have Claudio Solcer, who's a former professional football player. That's why he's got that chess. <laughs> <laughs> and he is also the former chairman of the Ethics Committee for FIFA uh, until July. And then we have Laurent Vidal, who is professor and an expert in public corporation law and chairman of Sorbonne ICSS Research and Program. Please welcome all of our guests right now. <laughs> Andy, let's begin with you. You have been working with sports and governing bodies to build a framework for transparency. How big of a problem is this? What is the scale of the problem? Uh, firstly, I just want to say uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to uh, Do Doha Goals for inviting me. Um, how big is the problem of match fixing? I think from my experience, the vast majority of, uh, of sport is clean, but just one instance of uh, match fixing can damage sport and an athlete as an individual. So we have to do all we can to eradicate it. Um, match fixing is an evil that goes against the very core principles of sport, of fair play and honesty. And unfortunately, in the last five years, there's been more and more instances in the public domain, uh, football, for example, of match fixing investigations, uh, Italy, Germany, Finland, to name but a few. Uh, and nearly all of those investigations have been connected to unregulated betting markets. Where I work in regulated betting, uh, we still have to be on our guard. Um, you know, corruptors will play, try and place bets with us. So we have to do all we can to, to help sports. Is international cooperation the way forward? Uh, absolutely. Cooperation by all the key stakeholders. So that's myself as a betting operator, that's sports, that's gambling regulators, and that's law enforcement agencies. <coughs> Because the problem is international and it's cross-border. Um, and I've worked in this area for eight years and in the last few years there's been an encouraging momentum shift to, to tackle this issue. Betting operators are cooperating with each other, gambling regulators, the regulator in France and the regulator in Italy, for example, have signed a cooperation agreement. Um, the Interpol and, and FIFA have, have, have an agreement as well. There's various initiatives going on at a European level through the European Commission, uh, also through um, the Council of Europe, uh, United Nations, uh, UNESCO are looking, looking at the issue. You're working with a lot of yeah. different governing bodies. So how can betting operators help sports fight um, match fitching? Fixing, rather. Yeah, firstly, as, as a regulated betting operator, it's completely in our interests that sport is clean. Um, our customers won't bet if they believe corruption is happening in markets, and we can be the victim of match fixing as well. So we do all we can to, to, to help sport. So at Betfair, um, a company that has integrity and social responsibility at the core of everything it does, we have a dedicated integrity team, my team. We, they have access to technology, so every bet is recorded we can identify suspicious betting and then we have information sharing agreements which we pioneered in the industry with sports governing bodies so if there's an issue we can help them and we have 55 of those with sports around the world including FIFA, the IOC and UEFA. It's about building trust and helping sport. 
Okay, well, when the trust isn't there, Michael, what steps is Interpol taking to combat the problem? Eh bien, Interpol peut être un, un partenaire, en fait. Alors, si vous permettez, moi, je voudrais d'abord remercier les organisateurs et, et euh, les autorités du Qatar de m'avoir convié. C'est un grand plaisir et ça me permet en même temps de dire à quel point Interpol essaie d'apporter sa pierre à l'édifice pour euh, sauvegarder l'intégrité dans le sport. Alors Interpol, vous ne le savez peut-être pas, euh, qui a son siège en France à Lyon, euh, c'est une organisation forte de 190 pays membres, euh, ce qui la place dans les plus grandes organisations internationales euh, du monde. Et Interpol, qui cherche euh, d'abord à relier les polices du monde, à permettre de les soutenir au travers de bases de données, doit s'adapter aux nouvelles menaces et doit investir dans les nouveaux challenges. Alors c'est vrai que euh, les fléaux classiques comme les trafics de stupéfiants, les trafics d'êtres humains sont au, toujours au cœur des priorités de, des équipes d'application de la loi et d'Interpol. Mais intelligemment, le secrétaire général et les, les pays membres ont souhaité qu'Interpol investisse aussi sur ces nouveaux enjeux que constitue par exemple la cybersécurité, mais aussi l'intégrité dans le sport. L'intégrité dans le sport euh, est euh, viciée par la corruption, par les matchs truqués, par euh, les paris illégaux dont l'ampleur aujourd'hui est énorme avec les jeux en ligne et par le dopage. Donc euh, évidemment, euh, tout le panel pourra en parler. Interpol essaie d'agir au travers de partenariats. Donc euh, euh, Andy a cité le partenariat avec la FIFA qui est pluriannuel et qui est extrêmement important. Il y a aussi le partenariat avec l'Organisation mondiale antidopage, je pense qu'Olivier pourra en parler. Il y a aussi le partenariat avec des pays comme le Qatar qui finance justement tout un programme qui va à la fois permettre d'agir sur l'intégrité dans le sport, mais aussi permettre d'agir sur la sécurité des grands événements. Et le souhait d'Interpol est d'agir sur deux niveaux. D'une part, contrer tout ce qui touche à l'intégrité dans le sport, donc ce sont la coordination d'actions opérationnelles qui vise à démanteler des réseaux criminels parce que la criminalité organisée, bien évidemment, investit dans tout ce qui touche le sport puisque ça rapporte de l'argent. Et cet argent-là, qui en fait représente des masses énormes, des flux de capitaux énormes, est réinvesti aussi dans le tissu social. You've got, you know, technology. Ce sont des réseaux multiformes. D'abord, il n'y a pas de frontières pour ces réseaux. Ils utilisent les nouvelles technologies. Euh, les flux de capitaux sont volatiles, sont virtuels. Euh, le développement d'Internet, des nouvelles technologies, fait que les organisations criminelles savent tirer parti de toute ce, cette organisation, de ce monde virtuel, mais aussi des différences de législation des différences aussi de mise en place d'organes réglementaires. Par exemple, les autorités de régulation n'existent pas dans tous les pays et donc, évidemment, les criminels en profitent. Voilà. Claudio, let me get you in here. There's a debate going on right now in, in Switzerland. Who should take responsibility for addressing corruption? Is it state government or sports organizations? Euh, merci pour la question. C'est une question euh, très intéressante. Bonsoir euh, à tout le monde, surtout aux étudiants. Vous êtes le futur, vous êtes ceux qui doivent euh, apporter les, les, euh, la force dans cette nouvelle société. Euh, en Suisse, il y, a, il y a beaucoup de sièges des fédérations internationales. Il y a le CIO, il y a la FIFA, il y a l'UEFA. Et une règle fondamentale, c'est que euh, la corruption n'est pas euh, punissable en Suisse pour ce qui concerne tous les administrateurs de ces fédérations. Vous pouvez comprendre que ce n'est pas une chose euh, simple, c'est quelque chose qui, dans notre société, vient souvent critiquer. Ils disent pourquoi l'État ne peut pas poursuivre aussi euh, ces dirigeants qui, ne sont, euh, qui se sont font corrompre, qui, dans l'exercice de leurs fonctions, ne suivent pas euh, les, règles, euh, les règles, surtout euh, éthiques. Voilà, c'est une question qui, qui peut euh, être discutée pendant des heures. Il y a d'un côté l'État qui 
devrait toucher toutes les, 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 les parties de notre société, tandis qu'en euh, Suisse, il y a euh, une petite île, que c'est celle des fédérations, et en fait, on doit compter dans ces fédérations qu'il y a des procédures euh, claires, qu'il y a des règles claires, qu'il y a des, euh, aussi des organisations euh, procédurales à l'interne qui puissent naturellement euh, taper, qui puissent arriver à... Euh, euh, comme pour exemple la commission d'éthique de la FIFA, qui puisse aller à poursuivre ces personnes. And Andy, let me get you back in here into the conversation. You guys are doing things in the UK right now. Tell me about that model. Yeah, in, in the United Kingdom, um, in, it's a regulated betting market. And as a license holder, if you see suspicious betting, you have to report it to the regulator. And the regulator then works very closely with sport to decide uh, who best should investigate, who should prosecute, uh, where, who has the powers to, to do what. And then they also work with law enforcement. So it's a system that, that, that's in place and, and, and works well to unite uh, the various parties. Well, Olivier, you've got a big one here, doping. It's still a major threat to sports, uh, integrity worldwide. You've got Lance Armstrong that we all know was recently stripped of his medals. Um, do you think that doping is an even bigger problem than many people suspect? It is probably a bigger problem that we all suspect. Um, the analysis that are conducted reveal 1 to 2 percent of doping in average. I mean, more in some sports, more in some countries, and, but in average, 1 to 2 percent. We've got reasons to believe there's been studies, and there are regularly studies being published showing percentage between 5, 7, up to 15 percent uh, based on scientific approaches that we can put together or social science approaches that we put together. And yes, it is still considered if we discuss, and you refer, Chade, to some recent cases, if we read some of the books published by the athletes, if we listen to some of their testimonies, we've got reasons to believe that in some sports, in some countries, doping is well beyond these one to two percent that we hear about. So yes, it's still a major threat to modern sport. So what are the key areas for the anti-doping strategy? Well, they are multiple. I mean, we have to educate and we, we have to start by education. We need to explain to the athletes and the younger generation that doping is not a fatality. Doping should not be part of sport. Sport is, a, is about value, is about, of course, integrity, is about values and is about rules. When you take doping substances, you break the essence of sport. You break the rules, you break the values. And this is what has been said by some athletes who have been caught. You know, they really deeply regret cheating because they broke the essence of why they wanted to become, to become athletes. So education is certainly a very important part. Testing is, of course, very important, and we hear some athletes, and recently in tennis, for example, some athletes asking for more testing, because it's also a way to show your credibility. Test me anytime, anywhere, and I want to show that I'm clean. And I was very pleased to hear in the previous panel that some very high-profile athletes wanted to say they, they are clean. And after all, we are protecting us anti-dopers uh, and administrators of sports we are protecting the clean athletes. And finally, and this is why uh, it's very important for us to be on the same panel uh, as Interpol, it's because a lot of what you do today is also about investigations. Because not only testing, not only education can really reveal doping, we also have to conduct investigations and bring what we call the non-analytical cases, not based on a sample from an athlete revealing the presence of a doping substance, but we have to bring together testimonies, we have to bring together proofs that we collect from societal activities of the athletes that doping exists. And the Lance Armstrong case you revealed is certainly a very good example of this. You know, you were talking about basically a character, a character call. You know, when an athlete just crosses the line, how do you prevent an athlete beyond education you know, from popping a pill, getting an injection, does this really mean that we need to have uh, a greater punishment? Because right now, athletes, what do they lose? Well, I think the educational compo component is essential. I mean, we need to inform the athletes, we need to inform them about 
the rules about the risks. Sanctioning, unfortunately, this is not necessarily the nicest part of our activities, and this is often the one that people dislike in the public because we bring down, or there is the perception that we bring down some national heroes or sport heroes, but this is the reality of what we have to do. We have to sanction deviation from the rules and, in a sense, for making it lose part of our dream when we watch sport because as sport fans, this is, we've got the right to say, you know, we want to exclude uh, doped athletes. Sanction, we are currently facing a revision process of the World Anti-Doping Code, which will uh, come to final format uh, next year uh, in November 2013. And yes, there is a push by a lot of athletes, clean athletes and federations to extend the sanction from a um, two-year sanction today to a four-year sanction for major infractions. So yes, we are getting to harsher punishment for what some people refer to as the hard dopers. The hard dopers. You know, we heard from some of the athletes earlier today, and, you know, uh, one issue that came up is that if you fail a test, should you then be permanently barred from the sport? Do we need to, do well, we need to look at that, have these stiffer penalties here? Well, it's interesting because if you look at civil society and even criminology, uh, you are never punished for life or rarely punished for life. Uh, so there is always the right for somebody after a period of being excluded from a system to come back into a system. And this is quite essential also in sport. The sanction has to be heavy enough to be dissuasive, uh, but also when an athlete has completed a sanction, he or she has the right to come back clean. And the question for all of us is how long this period should be. It's a balance between, uh, of course, the right to compete. This is also a professional activity. This is also the issue of making sure that the sanction is strong enough, as I said, to be a deterrent. And finally, this is also a collective decision. When I was saying sport is about rules, I mean, it is not excluded from society, so the right to come back is within our societies. That's important. It's also how long we believe is deterrent enough to sanction an athlete who has doped before they can come back into the system. Laurent, let's get you into the conversation. You know, cricket match fixing, uh, fixing it's difficult to prove. How do, you, how do you catch them? Because someone can just simply say, hey, you know what? I wasn't that good that day. I just, I just lost. How, you know, how do you follow the, the paper trail in all of this? Je vais parler en français, Shadé. Alors, le doping, le dopage est quelque chose de très compliqué déjà en tant que tel, mais le trucage des paris et des matchs est encore plus compliqué en matière de preuves et de détermination des preuves. Pour revenir à l'origine, juste vous dire deux choses, deux phénomènes importants à comprendre. Déjà, Mireille en a parlé tout à l'heure, la question du rôle important aujourd'hui d'Internet et des outils de communication mondiaux qui favorisent précisément une dispersion des paris dans le monde entier. Deuxième phénomène crucial, la question du, du déplacement en fait, euh, des flux financiers, notamment vers l'Asie et vers les pays qui parient massivement. Ce sont deux phénomènes fondamentaux. Trois faiblesses à identifier aujourd'hui. Euh, ce que disait euh, Claudio tout à l'heure, déjà les fédérations, le monde sportif n'est pas doté aujourd'hui des outils suffisants pour lutter contre le trucage des paris et des matchs. Bon. Pour de multiples raisons, je n'ai pas le temps de rentrer dans les détails. Deuxième euh, phénomène, euh, la question du manque de coordination. Là aussi, on en parlait tout à l'heure. Une coopération insuffisante entre les États, entre les fédérations, le mouvement sportif et entre le mouvement sportif et les États. Euh, internationalement, lorsque vous allez chercher des preuves, en Chine, à Singapour, euh, en Europe, c'est très compliqué d'harmoniser les législations. Troisième phénomène, Le secteur non régulé des paris, c'est 95% du secteur aujourd'hui. D'accord Andy le rappelait tout à l'heure. Euh, la France, l'Australie, la Grande-Bretagne sont des pays dans lesquels il y a une régulation des paris en ligne. Ce n'est pas le cas dans 95% des pays du monde. Du monde. Donc, question. Lorsqu'on étudie cette question, il faut déjà se préoccuper 
des parties du monde qui ne sont pas régulées, d'où évidemment la grande difficulté. Alors, la différence entre le doping, le dopage, pardon, et euh, le trucage des paris, c'est que on se, on se dope pour gagner dans un trucage de match, on peut tricher pour ne pas gagner précisément. Et évidemment, vous l'avez compris, sauf qu'à tout à fait particulier, il est très difficile d'identifier quelqu'un qui, par hasard, aurait raté, n'est-ce pas, un, un, un but, ou aurait mal joué, ou aurait euh, fait un revers euh, qui, malencontreusement, euh, voilà, hein, serait dans le filet. C'est très compliqué. Alors, on a l'exemple de Davidenko, où c'était évident, et encore, on a eu des, de grandes difficultés à le prouver. Bref, aujourd'hui, on a peu encore de cas de figure dans lesquels on a tout catch, on a attrapé hein, les, les auteurs, c'est très compliqué aujourd'hui. Euh, ce que disait Andy, je reviens là-dessus, les régulateurs dans certains pays, que ce soit en France ou en Grande-Bretagne, pour faire bref, ou en Australie, lorsqu'il y a des signes évidents, ou du moins probables, qu'un match est en train d'être truqué, à ce moment-là, il y a un rapport direct à l'autorité de régulation qui peut, dans certains cas, faire cesser le déroulement du match. Voilà un exemple, mmh. mais... Encore une fois, c'est un signe, ça n'est pas une preuve. Hein, c'est en amont, alors après, il y a tout le processus pénal, administratif ou des sanctions sportives qui permettent précisément de sanctionner à ces trois niveaux les personnes qui sont supposées. Olivier voilà. wants has, wants to say something, wants to chime in. Oui, peut-être en français, puisque Laurent parlait en français. Je crois qu'il y a effectivement les éléments techniques et il y a des différences techniques entre les paris illégaux et le dopage dans le sport. Ce sont des aspects techniques, mais je pense qu'il est important d'essayer, de, au-delà des aspects techniques et de la difficulté technique dont nous sommes tous conscients, il est important de créer un cadre. Absolument. Je, pense, je pense que le cadre de coopération, et vous l'avez rappelé, qui existe entre les acteurs du sport et les gouvernements, il est important que ces deux entités se parlent. Et je peux reprendre l'exemple de l'AMA, on l'a évoqué précédemment en préparant cette, ce panel, L'avantage de la masse, c'est d'avoir ramené ces deux composantes qui sont essentielles pour lutter contre un phénomène comme le phénomène du dopage dans le sport, ensemble, autour de la même table, et que chaque, chacun apporte son savoir-faire, le sport, la connaissance du sport et des règles du sport, afin de préserver l'éthique du sport, les règles du sport et, et l'intérêt du sport. Et en même temps, les gouvernements qui ont un rôle à jouer et qui ont un rôle aussi dans la législation et les moyens qu'ils peuvent mettre en œuvre notamment les moyens d'investigation au travers des forces de police, par exemple, de telle façon à pouvoir faire communiquer ces deux mondes et au final, au-delà des aspects techniques, donner la possibilité de régler au mieux le problème, ou en tout cas de combattre un fléau qui, ou des fléaux qui sont des dangers énormes pour le sport moderne. Chad, est-ce que je peux, Chad, est-ce yes. que je peux répondre Donc, yes. en français, euh, toujours. Donc, Olivier, je, je, je souscris entièrement à, à l'analyse d'Olivier. D'ailleurs, dans les recherches que nous menons en ce moment avec l'ICSS, il y a quand même quelque chose qui se dégage assez fortement. C'est un, un body, en fait, un, une entité internationale en tout état de cause. Alors après, on peut discuter sur le fond, mais au moins une entité internationale qui permettrait de rassembler au moins un nombre de preuves. Donc le modèle, effectivement, de l'Agence mondiale antidopage est un modèle qui... Alors, on peut en discuter, mais qui, ça, ce modèle d'un de, 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 gouvernement international, ou du moins d'un gouvernement, d'un corps d'un constitué international, d'une agence internationale, on peut l'appeler comme ça, même si ce n'est pas une agence, en tout cas un, un hub, un réseau de rencontres, d'informations, c'est très important, et c'est une direction à laquelle on est en train de réfléchir. Voilà. Well, let me bring you in here, Maré. Um, illegal betting and match fixing, fixing is used to launder money. Can you tell me what Interpol is, is working on now to combat that? D'abord, Interpol met autour d'une table les représentants des pays chargés justement d'appliquer la loi. Il essaie aussi de créer, il l'a fait cette année au mois de novembre à Singapour, des grandes conférences où se mêlent d'abord des représentants du milieu du sport, des policiers, des universitaires, pour ensemble essayer d'analyser la situation d'échanger les renseignements. Euh, Interpol aussi euh, lutte contre la criminalité euh, financière. Hein. Donc là, nous avons affaire au blanchiment de l'argent, euh, qui est euh, une infraction difficile à cerner. Donc, euh, groupe de travail d'experts sur des dossiers. Vous allez avoir des enquêteurs de différents pays concernés, par exemple par un réseau criminel, qui vont se réunir régulièrement, échanger les renseignements de manière concrète, échanger des informations 
pour ensuite alimenter les procédures pénales et euh, permettre de progresser dans l'identification, dans la recherche des preuves, dans l'analyse des bonnes pratiques. Et bien évidemment, tout ce qui a été dit ici euh, fait que si, euh, à un moment donné, on n'arrive pas à tendre à une espèce de cadre mondial d'harmonisation de la réglementation de la législation, on aura toujours ces difficultés de se heurter à des pays, par exemple, qu'on appelle le paradis fiscal ou paradis financier, qui sont des blocages pour avancer dans les enquêtes, notamment sur les flux d'argent. Donc, Interpol essaie de faire, de manière très concrète, puisqu'il organise aussi des opérations en lien aussi avec le milieu bancaire, puisqu'on développe les partenariats aussi avec le milieu bancaire, mais on le sait, on se heurte toujours à un moment donné à cette frange de, de fonctionnement hors la loi, un petit peu hors la règle, qui est beaucoup plus, plus difficile à percer. Et véritablement, c'est la coopération internationale, mais pas uniquement la coopération internationale policière. Cette coopération internationale, ça a été dit, elle doit être de, de l'ensemble des acteurs. Et si on, on revient à la thématique de l'intégrité dans le sport, tous les acteurs sont concernés. Et ce qui a été dit, c'est que les sportifs sont concernés, le milieu, l'environnement du sport est concerné, il doit échanger avec tout, tout l'ensemble de ceux qui essaient d'apporter une pierre à l'édifice. Alors il y a le monde de la police, mais il y a aussi évidemment le monde de, 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 de la réglementation, le monde universitaire, et tout cela doit absolument se parler. C'est un peu ce qui se passe dans cette conférence ces jours-ci. Andy, you want to chime in? It seems like the reoccurring theme here is you need to find joint solutions. It's about partnerships. So what is actually being done to make that happen now? One crucial thing I wanted to mention that had yes. been talked about in relation to match fixing and betting was athlete education. We talked about it with WADA, but it's just as important to educate athletes around match fixing and betting. And at Betfair, we helped fund a program in the United Kingdom which led to over 5,000 athletes receiving face-to-face -face education, which is very important to understand the rules of betting, um, understand that unfortunately there are people out there who may try to corrupt them, so understand who they have to report that to, and also understand issues around inside information, which is also an area that can be very damaging to an athlete if they fall foul of inside information rules. So education, of athletes in for match fixing is, is, is crucial as well. And there's a European Union initiative that's just kicked off, which is funded by betting operators and the EU to expand education to more and more athletes in, in Europe and more of that is needed. I'd, I'd be interested to know how many of the athletes here today have received education around betting and, and match fixing. So do we have any athletes out there who can talk about that? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions out in the audience? Any yes. Please. So if you can also state your name and where you're from. Keith Ruth from France, IOC member. I just tried to do it in, uh, in English this time because we have uh, enough French. Um, <laughs> and yesterday I do it in French, so I tried to do it in English today. Um, I tried to, to say it in two minutes. Yes. First of all, uh, against doping. Um, in uh, earlier 2021, 20, uh, Juan Antonio Samaranche said we have to fight together between IOC, IOC uh, sport federations and governments of all over the world to fight against doping. And there is a big meeting in, uh, in Lausanne, uh, au Palais Beaulieu, and from this meeting come WADA, AMA in French. Uh, IOC give one million dollars and the other part must be given by the governments. But first of all, the IOC pay the whole part because it's difficult to have all the government together. But now it's okay, we go on. And sometimes for four years, it's uh, the presidency of uh, WADA is uh, occupied by um, a sport member. IOC member, and for four years after it by uh, politic man. Now it is an Australian uh, minister. Uh, the Honorable John Fahey. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. French. Today we try to do it to fight against, and it it um, 
We do it in IOC last year, the first time uh, Jacques Rogue, the president of the IOC, uh, tried to do a meeting at Lausanne, at the IOC. Richard Nobel, the general secretary of Interpol, was there. There we, we can find a lot of IOC members, a lot of uh, uh, ministers. Mr. Robert Robertson was there, uh, Madame Joanneau was there, Australian uh, minister was there to fight against match fixing. But it, it, uh, it's very, very difficult because we have international regulations for, to fight against doping, but we don't have international regulations, as you said, to fight against match fixing, but right. it's going on, and uh, uh, but it's a really good thing to, to speak about it here because the, w the whole world must know that it's a real danger, uh, as dangerous as doping against sport and results. Thank you so much. You you Merci, Monsieur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the back, please. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a student at uh, HSC Paris. I'd like to thank you for sharing your time with us today. Um, I would like to know what's currently being done and what still needs to be done to address the ease of accessibility of illegal substances to athletes at a school level. And the reason why I say this is because it's obviously at, the formative, you know, at this formative time that a lot of students might not have um, the, the purest of uh, intentions in terms of being ethical and whatnot and be willing to, in a sense, risk it all to make it and at the same time not know better. Because as far as I'm concerned, anyone can log in online at, these days and buy and get steroids, whatever drugs, any steroid that you want. and get it delivered to their door. So and is it not, I mean, does it not make sense to limit it at the source and just sort of be done with it? Claudio? Bon, c'est clair que c'est une question très difficile. Disons, si on regardait, on l'a entendu euh, pendant ces deux jours, alors qu'est-ce que c'est Sur le problème de l'intégrité, il y a euh, la protection, il faut le, le respect des règles. S'il n'y a pas de respect des règles, c'est un problème culturel. Et comment on résout les problèmes culturels On commence avant tout avec l'éducation. On doit avoir premièrement aussi des, des règles euh, et Enseigner, enseigner aussi par l'exemple, et là je vois la responsabilité sociale des champions qu'on a, qu a vus et, et les autres, de donner un bon exemple. De donner un bon exemple, c'est eux qui peuvent effectivement influencer les jeunes générations, les jeunes qui regardent ces champions comme des, des dieux, et c'est naturellement clair que c'est des acteurs très importants qui peuvent aider. Après, il y a la deuxième, solution, la deuxième phase où il faut monitorer. Il faut monitorer avec des organisations comme VAD, avec, comme euh, euh, Betfair, qui doivent contrôler que les règles soient euh, suivies. Et puis après, il y a la phase finale. La phase finale, c'est celle des sanctions. Donc moi, comme j'ai dit, je, fais, je faisais partie de la commission éthique. On regardait les violations. Et là... Quand on a des violations des règles, il doit, il doit avoir des sanctions sévères. Dans ce moment-là, on, on, on arrive encore à mettre de l'ordre. Mais c'est clair que, et on l'a entendu, et je me répète sur ce point, on l'a entendu, c'est l'éducation. L'éducation, c'est la chose primordiale et surtout avoir aussi un rapport différent avec euh, la défaite. À mon avis, la chose importante, c'est de savoir que la défaite, la pire défaite qu'il peut avoir, c'est une victoire obtenue par des euh, façons, par des moyens illicites. Uh, I, I know you okay. wanted to, to chime in, but if I could just okay. ask everyone, we just have a, a few minutes left. If you can leave your, make your questions really brief. Okay, go ahead, Mere. Hello, I come from a uh, university, Paris Dauphine uh, in Paris, in French. Uh, I'm sorry, I will speak in French because uh, they will answer me in French and my English is not very good. Euh, ce ne serait pas plus simple de sanctionner directement les gens qui développent le dopage et pas seulement ceux qui le consomment, comme pour la drogue où on sanctionne beaucoup les dealers, ceux qui la fabriquent et pas et peu ceux qui la consomment. Ce ne serait pas forcément de faire un exemple justement sur une grosse affaire et de sanctionner vraiment les personnes qui le développent Mais on le fait. Je veux dire, quand vous voyez un certain nombre d'affaires qui existent, on peut 
parler de l'affaire Balco aux états unis ou d'autres affaires. Aujourd'hui, les raisons pour lesquelles nous avons des accords avec Interpol, c'est justement pour remonter, si possible, les filières, identifier, ce sont souvent des réseaux mafieux qui existent derrière la distribution, la création parfois, la distribution de ces, de ces substances. Et ce que l'on essaye, justement, c'est de remonter à la source, d'où la nécessité de travailler avec les gouvernements et d'où la nécessité de nous assurer que les gouvernements ont des législations suffisamment dissuasives dans leur pays pour pouvoir considérer comme activité criminelle la production, la distribution de substances interdites, de substances dopantes dans le sport. C'est un axe de travail de l'Agence mondiale antidopage euh, auprès des gouvernements qui composent, comme vous l'avez compris, l'Agence mondiale antidopage. Let me go to the back here. Hello. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Harry and I'm from Egypt. Um, I'm just interested to ask the audience as a whole on if anyone should think um, that people using, or sports people, using performance enhancing drugs or max fixing techniques should be banned for life regardless of um, how, how bad it is. So anyone, anyone in the audience who thinks this to put their hands up so um, as this will wipe out the problems to sports integrity more quickly. Thank, thank you very much. So, I know that's an issue that we actually addressed here um, not yeah. too long ago. Yes. Hi. Oh, I'm Sofia from Spain. I wanted to make reference to the doping problem, but from a different point of view. Yes. From the athlete point of view. Um, I want to address the vulnerability of those athletes that as soon as, um, let's say, a rumor starts about their being um, engaged in a doping case, they're accused of it. What can be done in order to protect them and not, not let them be accused by fake rumors or false emails, as we've seen in previous cases. Who wants to take that? Well, il faut respecter quand même les, 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 les droits de la, de la personne. Il y a le premier principe que c'est la présomption d'innocence. C'est ce qu'on a aussi voulu toujours suivre. Une personne est innocente jusqu'au moment où il y a une décision de condamnation. Ça, c'est, je pense, le principe essentiel. Et puis, euh, on l'a entendu, je pense, à, à deux heures, deux heures et demie. Une chose intéressante, c'est qu'aussi les, les gens qui sont autour des athlètes, on a, on a vu, il y a maintenant différentes euh, personnes qui tournent autour des athlètes, ils doivent quand même, eux, protéger. On a vu, euh, dans une situation de crise, de voir des gens qui interviennent avec des plans particuliers. C'est clair. Après, on doit aussi compter... <coughs> Euh, et ce n'est pas toujours facile sur euh, la recherche de la vérité des, des masses médias. Euh, malheureusement, les médias euh, poursuivent surtout les nouvelles négatives. Et s'ils peuvent trouver des scandales, même là où il n'y a pas de scandale, là, naturellement, c'est clair que ça fait plus de nouvelles que euh, le contraire. Que si quelqu'un se comporte d'une façon positive, que de ce côté-là, il euh, n'y a pas l'intérêt des masses médias. Mais c'est clair qu'on doit commencer à essayer de, de, de produire un réseau de protection autour des athlètes. Et naturellement, c'est toujours plus difficile, je pense, pour des athlètes qui pratiquent un sport euh, simple et pas un, un sport euh, d'équipe. Claudio, thank you. Well, we have uh, run out of time on this uh, subject matter. I'd like to uh, thank all of our guests here. Let's give them a round of applause. Muriel Bellastrazzi, Andy Cunningham, Olivier Rabin, Claudio Sulcer, and Laurent Vidal. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Engaging thank you. conversation. Thank you. And uh, actually, stay tight. Don't go anywhere. Don't you move. We are, we're going to change the discussion here, and you can please uh, exit. Thank you. I'm going to bring on my other guests. We're now going to talk about values in the next generation. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, joining us for this discussion, we have some students who are joining us. I can't wait to hear from them. She's beautiful. We have Bernd Asan, Fred Eng, and Esar Gabriel, and John Steele. Hello. How are you guys? You guys are ready to talk about values in the next generation? This is something, we've got 400 students here, and um, we need to talk about the future here. Who wants to start this off? Let me give everybody's quick bio. Bernd Asan is the head's UNICEF's regional office for Latin American and the Caribbean. We have Fred Eng, who is the founder and president of International Alliance for Youth, a nonprofit. Esar Gabriel, who is the general secretary of IAAF which is a big in track and field, and John Steele, 
with him, he has these two young ambassadors, and I can't wait to hear from them. Um, let's begin with, how can we take the values of sports and integrate them into the youth today? Need to go yes, first. Bert. Why not? <laughs> uh, well, I, th I think it's important that it's said that according to the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the Convention of the Rights of People with dis Disabilities, actually participation in sports is considered a human right. And I, and I think that's a value we really need to build on uh, for the next generation that uh, are here in the audience and with us here on stage. Finally, some young people on the stage, that's great. And, and, and I think we also have to look at the work the NGOs around the world are actually doing. Because lots of the solutions we are looking for are out there, maybe at a small scale, but it's out there. And we just need to find them and help them to do this uh, at the bigger scale, hopefully with support of the, of the cooperation that we have in the audience. And then I think we have to make the consideration that actually the fulfillment of human rights require public policies. So we have to mobilize political will to support all the wonderful work the NGOs here present are doing. You know, tell us the impact sports has played in some of the programs that you guys have come up with in Latin America. Well, well I'm seeing almost every day examples how participation in sports help children to develop to the maximum of their potential. Is there one personal story that you have? Is there one yeah, well, that I, stands I, out? I went to Colombia uh, just, just a few weeks ago, and they have, uh, they use football, soccer, um, to keep children in school, because they know sc school is boring in many of these countries, and, and boys and girls would like to do other stuff, so they have introduce playing soccer as a way to keep children in school. And, and one of the, the kids there, uh, they said that they had invented the new rules. And that was that always the first goal in every match had to be scored by a girl. And I think we can see the creativity of young people when we give them the chance to work in an inclusive way and make everybody participate. Well, it certainly addresses the issue of gender equality there. Uh, you know, on their own, these kids are coming up ways to include everyone. Uh, let me, Fred, you work with so many students. Uh, how, how many students do, is your organization working with now? Well, the, the organization is out of school sports and uh, Relative to values, let me tell you a quick story. I was thinking when Bert was talking, I was doing an interview the other day on television. This may put it in perspective. There was an eight-year-old boy playing in a hockey game, and he missed a goal, and his father stood up and yelled, Aaron, you bum, you can never do anything right. And I said to myself, how would you like to be an eight-year-old with your father and the coaches and the people in the stands hearing you are a bum. And that is what our organization has been about. In, in America, in out of school, we have 24 million children playing in what we affectionately call little leagues. Whether it's football, baseball, basketball, it doesn't matter. They are coached by two million plus people who are parents. They are administered by over 100,000 leagues run by parents. Consequently, the question is, whoever trained and gave these parents values that they should have in working with children in sports? Nobody has. And so we see abuses, <laughs> psychological, emotional, physical abuses of children in sports across America, and yet we sit back and do nothing about it. Actually, nothing about it. We try but they're winning. And if we're going to change values for children in sports in America, then we need to begin putting pressure on people in communities who build and pay these facilities to be built 
to control what is happening in these programs. That's what our organization has been about. Asar, let me get you in here. You were talking about education in sports earlier with me. Does the Olympic movement need to take greater responsibility when it comes to education in schools? Yeah, indeed. Um, good evening, everybody. I, I, the Olympic movement, uh, to start with, um, fundamentally claims it's uh, something strong, which is its autonomy versus governments, from the UNESCO, WHO, down to governments, national governments, and to local government. <clears throat> so then the, the problematic for the Olympic movement is that, yes, it should do more, but it should do so not in attempting to act directly uh, in, the or, in, the, through the, in those organizations down to the schools, but rather through advocacy, uh, meaning to looking up to reach out and to discuss the topic and to look together to partner to then influence and then to, to get to where the, uh, the, the youth are and the children are which are at schools, because we know that 90% of the children are in primary school, Worldwide, 80% uh, are in secondary school. So that's where, if you were to target and prioritize, that's where you would go. And for us, the Olympic movement, it's, a, it's an equation which must be well, well resolved, which is not direct action. That would be clumsy, but it's true advocacy. And we are very happy to see that the Olympic movement now is regarded more and more as, uh, as probably actors who can help uh, you know, uh, all the issues we're talking about for the millennium with regards to health issues, etc., through sports. Okay, so how do we engage students really on their level? You know, they're on the internet, you know, they're playing their video games. How do we engage them? Well, the, the engagement has to be multifold. Of course, in <coughs> you're talking about uh, the supreme medium in this case for, for the young people. You'd, you'd have to ask them there, which is internet. Um, I have had the really the, for the good fortune of starting and working on the Youth Olympic Games when I was at the IOC. And uh, we made sure that on top of the event itself, we do did have an engagement plan which was through the social media before in the lead up with role models, with uh, a number of, of uh, projects to activate and to go and get uh, the young people interested if they were not in sports. Uh, during, of course, uh, and we had great champions who came up and said for free, I will be uh, an ambassador of those U nascent Youth Olympic Games like Usain Bolt, Yelena Izenbaeva, and Michael Phelps. And then after, and to sustain a long tail after the event and all through. So they, the ways to get them interested is first and foremost in our case is to dig in the, the central part which is the competitive sports, but that around that to come out with something else which reaches out into sport for all. And that was the concept of the Youth Olympic Games, which at the beginning, I think people were not uh, very much into or yeah, were a bit people, people were a little skeptical about that. You know, are you, um, you know, putting too much pressure on the kids or are they being... Too early, yeah. Well... And, and what, was the, what was the response? I, the, 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 the first edition of the Youth Olympic Games took place, as I would imagine a number of people here were took part and know, in Singapore in 2010. Uh, we had 3,500 athletes, the 205 National Olympic Committees had representatives there. The point that was making before was, um, is this just an Olympic Games for young people, i.e. are we pushing them to pull the throttle, to pull, put full throttle earlier, to or overtrain, etc. Or kids being exploited? Yeah, and that was not the case because people saw what it was about. It was yes, the Olympic Games for young people, 15 to 18 year old, but it was also something else. It was not just that. It was also a cultural and educational program, full swing, which took place while the athletes were at the, um, the, the, the Yov, the Youth Olympic Village, and was a vibrant hub where people exactly, where uh, the young people were fed with the, the teams we thought were valuable for them. Uh, we were just talking about integrity and doping. Uh, making sure that they got the message at that age, because later it might be too late. Uh, how to be a good set citizen of this uh, beautiful planet. Um, what is Olympism about? What are the values? So all that was also part of the Youth Olympic Games. So at the end of the day, uh, perhaps 30-40% of those athletes, and we saw some of them get medals in London already, uh, will make it into a top career internationally. 
But for all the others, we wanted to make sure they embraced the Olympic values and they were true sportsmen and ambassadors of sport in their communities, whether online or geographically their neighbor, with their neighbors. You know, and I actually have a question about this. You know, in terms of the Youth Olympics, is this just for the elite athletes? You, you know, what about that one kid who's living in the inner city who is not, you know, necessarily, you know, exposed um, to sports, but all of a sudden decides they want, they want to get into it, or they're not interested in sports at all? Uh, what, what, what does the Youth Olympics do for them? That's a good point. Well, that's precisely why the Youth Olympic Games are First of all, not the Olympic Games for youth. They have a cultural educational component for those who are there. You're right to say that these were the elite, and you could say they're already in the system. They go to uh, junior world champs <coughs> or youth world champs. So what's the point? Why spend all that money to organize this new event <coughs> with the IOC have a, that has not created uh, a new event since 1924 and the Winter Olympics? Well, the, it's total leadership. The IOC is putting forward and exerting leadership by saying, this is what we do. Um, and they're also saying that this is a platform and a catalyst, not only to be the one event, but to be used as a platform for others, for all of us, within the Olympic movement and beyond, to take example and then to say, I am going to come up with an initiative targeting youth, whether it's in the, 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 the domain of sport for all, or in our case, elite for that particular event. So the Youth Olympic Games are an event, but they're also a platform and a catalyst to reach out uh, and beyond. And to, to, to your question also about touching only on the, the athletes, that was not the case. We had young reporters, we had young organizers, uh, we had young ambassadors. Uh, we had, yes, the 15 to 18-year-old athletes, but the young ambassadors or journalists or organ organizers. organizers were from 18 to 25. So there was more than just the athlete and the elite athlete. And believe me, they were buzzing, reaching out between themselves and also to the local uh, young community. And John, your whole approach is putting uh, legacy into the hands of young people. Tell me about that. Well, that's the process we're in the middle of at the moment. It's not long since the Olympic and Paralympic Games were in London. And <coughs> you'll remember that back in 2005 when Lord Coe, and he mentioned it on the first day of conference, uh, went to Singapore to, to, to win the bid, um, that actually he talks about inspiring a generation and getting the young people of the world to choose sport. And uh, young people were at the centre of that bid. There were 30 young people in Singapore that day. And young people were at the centre of the Games, Olympic and Paralympics as well. They're involved in so many different things. And now with the legacy, there's a, a challenge for us as a nation. How do we continue that? And we did inspire a, a generation in the, in the UK, and I hope globally. But actually, inspiration needs to be fed, and, and the flame will die down unless it's tapped into and, uh, and fed. And that's really what, um, at Usport Trust, uh, we're trying to do our bit uh, in terms of lead your generation, which follows on from inspire a generation. And that is really empowering young people on the ground. We have 7,000 7, 7, kids, young correct? young ambassadors like, like Will and Abda, who in the lead up to the games, and, and they'll say more about this in, in a minute, I hope, but in the lead up to the games were in schools coordinating Olympic values, other values, and, and tapping into the power of sport and the excitement of the games. So post games, we believe that the legacy should be the same. And, it, and it's interesting because I've witnessed a bit of a pause. And, and yes, we have uh, governmental uh, outlines and Hugh Robertson outlined the legacy <coughs> for the nation, that's fine. But actually on the ground for young people, it's almost as if we've paused and we're waiting for a sort of a diktat from on high, a white paper or something that will tell us this, this is the legacy plans. And actually the legacy is with us. It's there in those young people. And, and at Usport Trust, we believe it's about empowering young people. So what Bert said, I absolutely agree with. Of course, everyone has to have the right to engage with sport and the opportunity. But there's more to it than that. We also need to empower them to shape and lead uh, how sport is and, and for us how the legacy is and, and I do believe it's it's largely an unt untapped resource we have an amazingly talented young generation in in the UK and I'm sure globally and we don't seem to tap into them um, and we, we've we've scratched the surface but every time I see young people taking ownership empowered to lead things in sport they do it so well 
I've seen them stand up at conferences like this and speak a lot better than any of my generation could. <laughs> um, so no, no insult, gents, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> but, but we don't sometimes tap into that resource and we don't empower young people like we could. And I think that's what the legacy has to be about. Well, you have empowered two young people and you've got two young ambassadors with you. Uh, tell me about them and I, I'd love to hear from you. Well, let me introduce Will and Abda, and perhaps if I can maybe start with Abda and get her to <coughs> tell a little bit about what, how she's been involved with Young Ambassadors and, and the Youth Sport Trust. Um, I'd just like to say hello. I'm Abda. I'm currently 16 years old, and I go to a school in East London where the, game, the games were held. Um, a lot of people ask me, what is a Young Ambassador? What is the role? What is it all about? And the Young Ambassador movement was created in the lead-up to the Games to inspire a generation through sport. And that's what we do. So what we decided to do is use the Olympic and Paralympic values in the lead-up to the Games, but also after the Games, to ensure that young people are inspiring other young people. You know, it can seem a bit hard that, you know, you see people, very inspirational people like Seb Kerr, and you think, oh, I could never be like that. But as a young ambassador, you can act as a role model so young people feel like they can achieve something within their lives. And there's been 7,000 young ambassadors. And some stories include one young ambassador himself, completely by himself, he managed to maintain his local sports center from closing down, and that was one of the toughest things. Another one, she was a girl, what she did is she thought that not enough girls were given the opportunity. So what she did, she would open up a club in her local area and really get the young girls out in sport, which was one of the things we spoke about in the task forces. Myself, as an individual, um, I made a two-year commitment to a club in my local primary school to run it, organize it, and eventually get them to perform on a stage. And they were very young, so they were like in year two, three, so they were like six, seven years old, which was something I did completely by myself. Um, a lot of people think, oh, okay, she's this young ambassador. You know, it's been a journey. It's been three years since I've been a young ambassador. And <coughs> it's, you would never believe it, but who can remember the really shy girl at the back of the classroom who would never speak? Exactly three years ago, that girl was myself. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at her, she's so poised, so confident, so it's really changed you. Yeah, it's really changed my life. I was born in Afghanistan, where there is very limited opportunities. But when I moved to Britain, and my lovely teacher, Miss Tansley, who's in the audience, she gave me the opportunity to be a young ambassador, and that gained my confidence, that increased my self-esteem, that allowed me to inspire the young people because when I was a young person, like when I was smaller, I didn't have that. So I felt like it was my responsibility to give it to the people because I never had it. And it's been quite a journey in those three years. And I really do hope that people in different countries take the Young Ambassador Program as a, as a kind of like a structure and hopefully take it to their country and really use it because it has completely changed my life. And it was all thanks to the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Well done. <laughs> and let's get your fellow ambassador in. So just like Abdul was saying, just give me some fine examples of how young people have taken responsibility for making change in their local communities, for taking on challenges really and trying to overcome those challenges. And um, we know as young people, going on for that, we, go, we, we know as young people that we're very privileged to have the Olympics and Paralympic Games in London, in our home country. And, it was a fanta fantastic atmosphere and really inspirational to have all those athletes there. And um, leading up to the Games, young people started to see sport in a new way, um, particularly in education. Uh, you know, both of us involved in education. We saw staff as well using sport in lessons, which even three years ago, two or three years ago, you would never see sport be used in a lesson. For example, maths. I was in a science lesson where sport was being used as a catalyst to really engage young people. And so it's about realising how sport can be used, not only as a competition or just taking part in, but in other walks of life as well. And, um, and en engaging young people who may not get engaged in other things other than sports. And um, along with that, just like uh, 
we were saying is about there's other roles in sports. It's not just about being a competitor, being a participant in sports. There are volunteers, the games makers at the Olympic and Paralympic Games, for example, it was a fantastic job that they all did. And we know that the games wouldn't have happened without them, just like the games wouldn't have happened without the, without the athletes. And promoting those different roles that are available to young people and to people across the world really shows that, that, that sport is for everyone, and that's something that really needs encouraging. And um, by combining those kind of two areas of it, using sport in, in different ways and promoting those other roles, you're really developing people. You know, sport ju doesn't just develop gold medalists on the track and field doesn't just develop gold medalists out there on the cricket, uh, cricket field, on the football pitch. They develop people, they develop gold medalists who can win gold in life and develop life skills that without sport never would have de been developed. So like with Abda, Abda says, she, you know, a few years ago she never would have got on stage, let alone speak on stage. You know, it just shows that being part of something like the Young Ambassador Programme um, can really empower and give young people something to work towards, something to develop, and somewhere to, somewhere, something to achieve. And I think Abdul's a fine example of someone doing just that, and I'm sure there's millions of young people across the world who are doing that or want to do that. And so, I th I th you know, just, just to finish from me, really, I think in terms of legacy and going forward, um, young people were at the heart of the, the Olympic and Paralympic bid in 2012, and really, surely, young people have got to be across the world and take on the baton and be at the heart of creating the legacy that that leaves behind, you know, whether it's in sport, in education or in life as well. And hopefully young people can help every individual in the world win gold in their life. I'm, I'm just so impressed with these guys. Uh, you know, I think you guys are both a representation that this program actually works. I think you guys have a bright future ahead of you. Thank you. Okay, well, yes. uh, we are hard at work with the city of Rio now uh, preparing the legacy for the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games and it would be really wonderful if we can count on the support from these ambassadors because we really need those young voices to energize us. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I want to I throw this back again to you. How, how has this experience changed you? You know, we heard from Abdul that she was, used to be shy. Clearly, that's out. <laughs> uh, how's it changed you? From being here at the, the, at the forum or just generally being part of the, the ambassador Isn't program? Being a part of the ambassador program. It, I really think it's um, helped me understand, because before I really wouldn't have thought sport in the same way. I've realised that sport is, is actually completely different from before I was a young ambassador. So just going back to when I first became one, my, um, my PE teacher came, came up to me the day before the, uh, the local kind of selection process and went, Will, you need, to, you need to come up with a presentation to present to be a young ambassador. And I said, all right, okay, when's it for? Next week? I went, no, tomorrow. So I really didn't know what I was letting myself in for. And it has honestly been one of the best things that I've ever taken on and something which I'm really honoured and feel very privileged to be part of. And, you know, being here and being at other, other events around the world and just seeing and hearing from so many people that, that, that are involved in sport. And just like Abda, I, wouldn't, I would not have been able to get on stage and, and, and speak to, to this audience, you know, a few years ago. It's really such a, and just like I was saying, it's really something which develops people and develops life skills and I think that's really something which needs to be tapped into away from just competing and taking part in sport. You know, everyone, everyone can develop themselves in, to being a good businessman by using sport or being a good parent by using sport. Well, bravo to the both of you. You wanted it's to chime pretty in. pretty impressive to see, uh, to see that illustration, but uh, it makes me think about something is that us at the Olympic movement, the IFs, the National Olympic Committees, uh, um, and even the IOC, sometimes there we are criticized by saying that we organize elite events and forget about um, the, the part which is the sport for all part, as we call it. Uh, here you have a great example is that the Olympic Games, just like the Youth Olympics or a World Championship at a smaller level, are a catalyst then to see uh, the gov a governing body like the UN saying, I'm going to take advantage of Rio and saying I'm hard at work, is great to hear, but it should be acknowledged that the catalyst and the Olympic movement does a lot and is engaging. Yes, we might have a history. In the case of the IWF, we're 100 years old this year. We might have a history of started with competitive sport and organized that type of sport. But yes, also, 
we should be part of the equation rather than be criticized and be uh, part of those, this advocacy which brings together all the parties. Now the question is, and you put it rightly, is the sustainability of what you're talking about. How many of those 7,000 will still be active uh, when the lights will be totally off at the end of the year in a couple of years? How many of the, the projects we're talking about and how many examples we're putting forward, how many next to that will not be in the, in the loop in the picture? And away from the Olympic Games or the Youth Olympics now, how much is done to really activate and the policy makers to take on board sport and to really make it a fundamental asset and start a dialogue which is not the, the physical education against sport, not the, the governments against the Olympic movement and coming together. And that I think is, should be strongly said here okay. because there's not many of us from the Olympic movement in, around here. Guy Drew took the, the, the floor a, a while ago. It should be said that the coming together is through dialogue, and uh, this is a really great example of how we can leverage on the events we organize. John, you wanted to chime in on yes, this. Yes, I think just picking up on the sustainability point, because you're absolutely right, it, it can't burn bright and die away when the ambassadors grow older and move on. But I think this model is all about sustainability. It's about empowering communities and people within them to behave in a different way. And on the back of London 2012 was the um, International Inspiration Programme, which uh, it went to 20 different countries um, and impacted on 12 million young people, uh, which, and which continues and hopefully will continue today. But that was about going into communities that perhaps didn't have the advantage of sport and uh, training and engaging young people to be the role models, not stepping in from the outside, being the role model and then stepping out again. And that's where, I mean, the very inspirational gold medalists and athletes we've seen are one thing, but getting real life role models that can be seen and touched on a daily basis is how you get longevity. Absolutely. And Correct. Fred, I know that there's also another issue that we actually talked about yesterday. Um, when do you introduce sports to kids? Because there's a little different philosophy that's out there. Some people say you should introduce it as early as you can so it becomes a part of who they are and they carry it with them through the rest of their life. But you're of the mindset that too early can lead to burnout. Oh, I've, absolutely. I'll give you an example. We did a study in, uh, at Northern Kentucky University of children six to eight years old. We tested a thousand children, and of those thousand children, testing them on the skills of throwing, catching, kicking, hitting, 49% didn't meet the minimum requirement to be successful in whatever sport they were playing. So what does that tell you about what we're dealing with? And, and I think it's wonderful that we have the ambassadors program but we're dealing with the cream of the crop, and I applaud them. But our organization is concerned about children who don't have a chance to play. I've been to places in Africa, to Latin America, to across the world, where I've seen children who would love to be able to play. They have no equipment, no facilities, and that's what our organization is, is trying to do. One other important point, I think it's so interesting that I bet I have heard when we talk about life skills, all of the skills such as determination and perseverance and loyalty and respect. But if I throw out a couple other words of what children were, are, are learning in sports, you're going to have to agree with me. Children are learning when at all cost. They're learning to not even pay attention to officials. They're learning to cheat. We look across the street, there's a monument to cheating. We're dealing with individuals who coach children, who teach all these things to children. The result is, is that by the age of 13, many studies have been done, 70% of the kids that began as young as three years old will have dropped out of sports. And the reason they drop out is our fault. It's our fault that we're allowing them to drop out because the pressures that we put on them. So my, my plea to you, as people in communities, we've been talking about 90% of the people who are successful people at this forum, Olympic athletes. We need to begin to look at the base of the pyramid where children need to be given that chance because if we're going to teach those valuable life skills, then we have to have a plan. The final thing I wanna say is that we have a new program. It's called Let's Talk Sports. And it's engaging parents and children to discuss these 
very life skills. We can't assume that they're going to learn life skills and it's inherent in playing. It's like saying that you learn nutrition when you eat an apple or that you learn health, healthy habits by brushing your teeth. We have to get children and parents to work together so that someday, someday, the child comes home from a game and the parent says, not who won the game today, they come home and they say, what did you learn about teamwork today? What did you learn about discipline? What did you learn about perseverance? That's when sports will become valuable. Sounds good to me. But they can, they can, <laughs> they can also enjoy, if I may say, having come home and saying, we won. Huh? Yeah, that yeah, doesn't won. stop them from doing There's that. There's a healthy balance to it all. can have the one and the other. <laughs> it's a healthy balance to it all. Let's give a round of applause for all of our guests. Bert Asan, Fred Eng, Asar Gabriel, and John Steele, and our two ambassadors who have a very bright future. Thank you all. Thank you.